Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as director of the library here in Ann Arbor and also the museum in Grand Rapids. Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration with additional support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. We're very grateful to those of you who are members of Friends of Ford and contributors to the foundation because you help make possible these programs. Tonight, as usual, we are filming by, with Michigan Media, so when we get to the question and answer period after the speaker, please go to the microphone at the center aisle to ask your questions so that those who watch this later on video can hear your questions. And now, the standard bit of housekeeping, would you please make sure your electronic devices are turned off or silenced. Tonight, it's a real pleasure for us to welcome James Rosebush, who is the author of True Reagan, What Makes Ronald Reagan Great and Why It Matters. Mr. Rosebush went to the White House at the mere age of 32 to direct a program that was a pet project of Ronald Reagan's, serving as his point man on philanthropy and private public partnerships. For six years, he was in near daily proximity to Ronald Reagan, serving simultaneously in three roles as deputy assistant to the president, chief of staff to the first lady, and senior White House advisor. Mr. Rosebush was the longest serving chief of staff to first lady Nancy Reagan. In that role, he managed all of the official activities of the first lady, including press and media, scheduling, projects and policy, as well as official functions at the White House. He also managed worldwide state visits for the Reagans, traveling with them and negotiating with host country government leaders, including negotiating with Russian officials for the historic bilateral meetings between Reagan and Gorbachev. Mr. Rosebush had never met Ronald Reagan before joining his administration and was insatiably curious to understand the leader he served. He was often at Mr. Reagan's side in Washington and around the world, frequently alone with him as they waited for a limousine or for a world leader to arrive for a meeting or just waiting for Mrs. Reagan to join them. This was incredible proximity, again, for a 32-year-old, and he learned quickly to ask the right sort of questions because over time, President Reagan, little by little, revealed a great deal more of his inner self than was his usual practice. Mr. Rosebush is currently Chief Executive Officer of the international consulting firm Growth Strategy, a position he has held for over 20 years. He is a widely recognized leader in building and management, managing corporate, wealth management, and philanthropic organizations. He has degrees from Boston University and Principia College and has lectured and served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown and George Washington University as an author and, of course, frequently has appeared on television and radio. We have copies for his book for sale, which I highly recommend. So please join me in welcoming James Rochebooth to the Ford Presidential Library. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elaine, for that very warm introduction. And I have to, if you'd excuse me, say that I'm happy to be home because as I think Elaine did omit this, although it's always interesting to listen to someone introducing you because you learn things about yourself that you might not have known. In fact, I didn't know I was only 32 when I held those positions. Perhaps if we could only immortalize ourselves and freeze ourselves in time, it would be a great idea. Uh, like the children's book that my young daughters read uh, when they were young about uh, a young uh, boy who was immortal and uh, stayed at the same age. You may be familiar with that. I always thought that would be an attractive thing to do. And I think I would have frozen myself right there in the Reagan White House because it was truly a marvelous experience. But it is wonderful to be back home. You know, we've been traveling across the country over the past four months. And I have to say, it's been fascinating to be on the political uh, campaign trail again, visiting many of the cities and going to many of the sites that I did with the Reagans in the 1984 campaign, as a matter of fact. However, in this campaign, I was traveling with a very likable candidate, Ronald Reagan. 
So, well, I was out there with the other candidates, I won't mention them by name, uh, often uh, crossing paths in different cities, talking to audiences. I had the great pleasure of talking about and explaining and enlightening audiences about that quiet interior that President Reagan never revealed about himself. And as a matter of fact, Nancy Reagan said, there were times I couldn't reach Ronnie myself. So he was actually even distant to her. This was the book that in days leading up to her passing in the times that I spent with Nancy Reagan, she referred to my book as the book that Ronnie couldn't write about himself. And if that makes you curious about it, that's good because they make good Christmas gifts. But it also <laughs> should make you curious to want to know why so many biographers have actually missed an explanation of who Ronald Reagan really is. And for the sake of millennials, who I work with a great deal today, who have no interest in history except for how it impacts them, I titled my book, Why It Matters. Because today, to look at history, millennials in particular really want to know the so what. So I've asked myself, what is the so what about Ronald Reagan? What is it about his character that gave him the ability, the strength, the courage, uh, and the uh, intelligence to really uh, accomplish what he did, particularly with creating the longest sustained economic recovery uh, in American history and also bringing down uh, the uh, Soviet uh, uh, bloc and ending the Cold War, at least contributing to it. He would never take credit for that himself. But in retrospect, we can see that Reagan was the grand strategist. Uh, and he was able to do that. So I'm going to talk about this, share some of these things with you tonight. But first of all, of course, being here in the home of Gerald Ford, I want to say that uh, Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan uh, were rivals in politics, but brothers in character. You know, character is something in leaders that there's a tremendous lack of today. And it seems that it's in critically short supply at a time when it is needed more than ever, not just in our country, but worldwide. And I want to relate to what we share together tonight some about this um, as well. Ford and Reagan were obviously both Midwesterners by values, temperament, upbringing, and education as well. They both felt a strong commitment to service, to country, and to their fellow man. Both were decent, honest, friendly, and never saw their adversaries as enemies. They were both conflict averse, which is an interesting character trait, and trusting, perhaps to a fault. Now, the impression of Ronald Reagan being a Midwesterner was embedded in my mind the day that we were at uh, the Bethesda Military Hospital and Reagan was about to go in for surgery. And we decided at that time, rather than being an outpatient experience where he'd be going back to the White House that night, that he would actually remain in the hospital overnight. And so I was by his side and he said, Jim, would you mind going back to the White House to get a change of clothes for me because of be coming out uh, to the public the next day? And I said, no, Mr. President, of course I would do that. And so I went down in front of the hospital where there was a set up a White House motor pool and got in one of the blue Chrysler sedans and was driven back to the White House and went up to the family quarters. And um, the president's closet and dressing room, sort of you call it dressing room, it wasn't really that lavish, was situated directly between the president's and first lady's bedroom and the study, today we would call it a home office, where the Reagans were often photographed having dinner on TV trays. And so many of you have seen that picture. They sit in red floral chairs. And then there was the president's bathroom there. And uh, I, I often tell this story about the Reagans' bedroom because it was uh, wallpapered with hand-painted birds. And the president often remarked about how he would lie in bed with a slingshot and try to hit the birds <laughs> on the walls. And that was a sentiment that was not shared by Nancy Reagan, nor appreciated, I think. Uh, but it's sort of an, an oval room, a very grand room. So anyway, I, I went through the bedroom and uh, went to the closet and to do my errand. And I stood there in utter amazement 
though also being a son of the Midwest, as, as I started to say, I'm from Flint, and I did drink the water, by the way, at that time, that was a long time ago, although there was a creek that ran right by our house, and it was very often, or invariably, purple, red, yellow, even at that time, all those years ago. Um, so, in any case, I, I looked at this closet, and I thought, well, what am I going to choose for the present to wear tomorrow? Well, there was one blue suit, one black suit, one brown plaid suit that, by the way, any morning the president got up and put that brown plaid suit on, it was so hated by the staff, because it was also very hard to photograph, that word would go out from the uh, family quarters, Reagan has that brown suit on today. <laughs> And so the press corps would be alerted to it. It seemed that everyone, and, and this is also a, a character trait of Reagan, his stubbornness. So he, on more than one occasion, people would say, implore him, do not wear that brown suit. It's, it's just, it doesn't work. And he would invariably put it on the next day. So there was the, each of these suits. Then there was a pair of brown shoes, black shoes, and so forth. And I stood there, and it was galvanizing for me. And you know, it's one of those moments we all have that just crystallizes everything for you. And I saw at once, though Reagan had been portrayed as a president of luxury, all of his rich friends and, and all of this sort of thing, that was who, it was not who Reagan was at all. Reagan shared these qualities with President uh, Gerald Ford of being a Midwesterner with Midwestern tastes and values. And he was not a man of vanity or did he seek, uh, was he particularly acquisitive, nor did he seek uh, luxury uh, in his own uh, clothing or anything having to do with what we would call today his own brand? So I thought in an instant, this is pure Reagan. This is what Reagan really represents, these great Midwestern values. And uh, it, was, it was very meaningful uh, to me. The same day, by the way, Reagan uh, I, I have between, I, I guess when I went back to, uh, to uh, attend to him or uh, visit with him later, I took a letter that my older daughter, who was then, I think, six, had uh, written to the president, which was a drawing of a rainbow. And she said, Dear Mr. President, get well. I hope you get well soon. I love you, Claire. So I gave it to the president, and uh, he looked at it and read it, and he said, Jim, could you hand me a piece of my stationery, which was green uh, laid stationery with the presidential seal on it. No one else was allowed to use that. And I, I must say that most of us in the White House staff, when we would go home at night, would cram White House stationery <laughs> in our pockets. Uh, but that was not, as a matter of fact, there was one day that uh, someone who was on my staff, who's head of advance for Nancy Reagan, he was notorious for, you know, presidential cufflinks? Well, I learned that his garage was stacked full of an inventory of presidential cufflinks. So when he retired, when he left the White House, I had Nancy Reagan do a videotape message for him. And in it, she said, Bob, thank you so much for all the years of service, but would you, re would you mind returning about a thousand pair of cufflinks to the White House supply? Because we really need them. Uh, so, you know, the, these things happen. But anyway, President was writing on his own personal stationery, and he wrote a note to Claire, which is still hanging in her home, framed, and it says, uh, Dear Claire, thank you so much for my letter, for your letter and your beautiful painting, I Love You Too, signed Ronald Reagan. So then the uh, doctors wanted to wheel the president down to the operating room, and I went halfway down the hall, but that was not a part of my responsibility, but I turned left to what I thought would be to go home, and I went through these swinging doors, and I thought, well, I was just going out again to the motor pool to get a car to go home. Well, I walked into a bank of journalists and television cameras about 1,200 of them. So it'd be like in a room like this, and it was just a bank of lights focused on me and people yelling questions to me. And of course, I took the attitude, both working with the president and the first lady, that everything uh, publicly, public comments, should be really uh, controlled and put out by the press secretary. I really respected that role. So uh, 
However, I had been striving, and this is a part of this story, uh, I think perhaps I had a, a, a higher than uh, usual level of curiosity about these people. I didn't come from California, I didn't come from the film industry, I didn't come from the Reagan campaign, uh, and yet I had this desire to figure out who they were and what was going on inside, which was almost impossible. But again, in one of those crystallizing moments, I realized standing in front of all those people who were desperate for a story, think about it, the President of the United States is going, into the, going under the knife, and they have to report something. And so I realized in that moment I had something to say. I took out the letter, I showed them the letter, and that played on the front page of every major newspaper the next day. Now, the value of that was it showed Reagan's state of mind, his frame of mind, it showed his alertness, but it also began to reveal some of the character of the man. It reminds me of the night that I took Nancy Reagan to uh, a drug uh, rehab program in Florida. The program was called Straight, and we were going to the graduation ceremony where it was in a big gymnasium, and the parents sat on one side, and the uh, students sat on the other side, and it was the night where the students would learn whether they had earned the right to go home and be reunited with their families. And I'm telling you that even the Secret Service was crying, and Secret Service is not allowed to cry, by the way. So we, everyone was just dissolved in tears. And uh, so I was uh, you know, sitting there with Nancy Reagan, and, and we had prepared remarks for her. She always gave her remarks on large index cards that were typed in about 18-point font, and uh, there were nice remarks that had been prepared. And obviously, I said, well, we have to throw those out. And she said, I, I agree completely. So at the end of this incredibly emotional evening where some students, and when they learn that you hear your, call, your name being called out, you run to your parents and you're told you've earned the right to go home or you haven't. And they just collapse in each other's arms. And so she got up. And this was during the time of her refurbishment of her own public image. And she took the microphone and tears streaming down her eyes. I'm going to cry here myself. And she said, turned to the parents and she said, I know there's no hurt like the hurt a parent can feel if their child is in trouble. And then after speaking for a few minutes, she turned to the students and she said, I love you. You have your you have a great future ahead of you. And I want, I want to stand by you. I want you to realize and, and to have a fulfilling life. And she went on to talk to them this way. And it was the night that the press corps that was traveling with us said to me, what happened to this person? What happened to Nancy Reagan? We began to see inside of her soul. We began to see that there was something there going on in her heart. And I remember on our motorcade ride back to the hotel that night, we were exhausted and we both had our heads on the back of the, in the back seat of the limousine, you know, on the lid in the back. And I said to her, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, whenever the heart speaks, however simple the words, they're always acceptable to people who have hearts. That was really the beginning of Nancy Reagan revealing her heart. It was always difficult for Reagan to do the same, but these little insights gave me a picture of who really Reagan was from the inside out. Now, to go back to Ford for a minute, because I think it's important, and I want to honor Gerald Ford here, he really gave uh, Ronald Reagan an opportunity to present himself to the world, of course, at the 1976 convention, where Ford, of course, had earned almost enough uh, votes for the nomination and then ultimately did get uh, the nomination. But uh, he was urged by his aides, uh, you know this story, to invite the Reagans down to the platform um, to make a few uh, remarks. And this was, in a way, just the way President Nixon had helped Ford. And I've, I've been, as I say, on this extended speaking tour, um, I think extended because there's such um, uh, desperation, really, on the part of all of us to learn uh, what makes a great leader of character. So at the Nixon Library, my talk, uh, featured some of the things that Nixon did to help President Reagan. And in this case, Ford really gave uh, Nixon, uh, Reagan an opportunity to really say something to the American people at that time. And here's what he said in part. 
In looking back on this time, 100 years from now, will they say, thank God for those people in 1976 who headed off that loss of freedom, who kept us now, 100 years later, free, who kept our world free from nuclear destruction, whether we have the freedom that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Now, this is pure Reagan. So Reagan, who, though he was called the great communicator, said, it wasn't that I was a great communicator. It was that I communicated great ideas. And if you read Reagan, you see that he often frames his uh, remarks based around a question. He'll say, for example, what is at the root of freedom? What is the, at the heart of freedom? So here he's asking a question. These remarks were not prepared. There was no teleprompter, but this just came out of Reagan. Uh, he asked this question, will people 100 years later say that these people fought for freedom? And then <laughs> he calls for action, which is another great Reagan trait in communication. To frame your remarks with a question, or to stimulate interest with a question, and then call for action, like of course he did at the Brandenburg Gate, which we'll talk about in a minute. I love that, that uh, structure to his uh, communication. The next day, Reagan uh, thanked his campaign staff while President Ford went on to his presidential campaign. And he recited for them a little saying a uh, British saying that he learned when he was uh, a young boy. I'll lay me down and bleed a while. Although I am wounded, I am not slain. I shall rise up and fight again. Now, you know that uh, the rest is history, but we can be sure that these two leaders always maintained a genuine cordiality throughout their lives that is the mark of true character. And I want to read to you just a brief portion of a letter between Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan. It was a letter written in July of 1980 uh, thanking, and it's addressed to dear Nancy and Ron, thanking them for a gift that they had given to the Fords. And uh, President Ford says, in part, I am grateful for the understanding each of us has had for each other's point of view during uh, our negotiations. And I was proud of the way our negotiate, negotiating, negotiating staff worked to find a common resolution. Will you express my thanks to your staff? Uh, November 4th, 1980 is one of the most uh, crucial days in the history of our republic. And as I've said before, you can count on me to help in any way to bring about the election of the Reagan-Bush ticket. I'm clo in closing, let me reiterate our gratitude for the friendship with both of you. You have our warmest best wishes for success, Jerry Ford, written in his own hand. Now, this is the kind of character and uh, gentlemanliness and high level of esteem and character that we need to be demanding, not accepting the disappearance of. So where did their character come from and why do we lack it today? We're told by writers like uh, Aaron David Miller of the Woodrow Wilson Center at the Smithsonian in Washington, who writes in his book, The End of Greatness, that America will never have great leaders again, and that we should stop looking for them. What a preposterous idea. No more Washingtons, no more Lincolns, FDRs, Reagans, or Fords. If that is true, my friends, we are doomed. We have to have a serious talk about this. In my Harvard Business Review article of two years ago called Where Have All the Leaders Gone, I delve into the seven different uh, causes, I think, for the disappearance of character-based leadership in our country and in our world. And I think that one of the most fascinating things about this is that we invest today a great deal of money and effort in creating leadership institutes, centers of leadership, not just at the university level, but at the elementary school 
uh, level. I have two, I have four grandchildren in elementary school. They all have leadership training programs. And yet, we have less leadership today than we've ever had before. Why is that? Could it be that we teach leadership to be based on self-reliance rather than a reliance on principle and ideals? This was the life that Ronald Reagan really embodied and lived for. Tolstoy, in writing at the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's uh, birth, said something fascinating, and this was shared with me. You know, when you're out on the uh, speaking circuit, especially on a topic like this, people love to tell you both about their experiences with Reagan that they might have had, and I could tell you about. I had one night uh, a woman came up to me and she said that her grandmother was one of the people, the 77 people that Ronald Reagan rescued and saved on the Rock River when he was a teenage life, lifeguard. And you know, Ronald Reagan was a person, if you ever ask him what was your favorite job, you would think it would be uh, as a screen actor. No, being a lifeguard on the Rock River in, uh, in Dixon, Illinois, for four summers, and he made good money doing it, but he was most proud of it, as were documented in the local newspaper and still available for you to see today, he saved 77 lives. Now, I believe, if you remember anything from this talk or about Ronald Reagan, is that he saw himself throughout his career as a lifesaver. That is how he wanted to be remembered, not just for those summers on the Rock River, but for what he did in all of his jobs, and most importantly, as president. But this is what Tolstoy uh, wrote about Lincoln. He says, now, why was Lincoln so great that he overshadows all other national heroes? He really was not a great general like Napoleon or Washington. He was not such a skillful statesman as Gladstone or Frederick the Great, but his supremacy expresses itself altogether in his peculiar moral power and in the greatness of his character. He had come through many hardships and much experience to the realization that the greatest human achievement is love. This is Tolstoy writing about Lincoln. It he was great through his simplicity. Also writing about Reagan was, and Lincoln, as you know, was also a son of the Midwest. So writing about Reagan, William F. Buckley said, the conclusive factor in the matter of American security against any threat of Soviet aggression was the character of the occupant of the White House, the character of Ronald Reagan. So writing and speaking about character-based leadership, um, I've had to sort of define what I mean by character because it's one of those things you heard said and sought after, but you don't know exactly what it is, right? You know you want it but you're not sure exactly how to define it. So this is my stab at it. Um, I've said for myself that uh, character is a commitment to a moral belief system found outside of oneself that is adopted on the inside, committed to, and deployed for the good of others. Now I think that today, a lot of young people are trained, you know, get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I can do it. I can be president. I can be this. I can be that. You can do anything. And they're, you're, they're told by their parents, by their teachers, by their leadership trainers. But is that enough? Is it enough for us to think we can be great? We can be great leaders of character because we have it in ourselves? Or is it because it's in our ideals? Ronald Reagan, as early as 1954, speaking at... William Woods College, which is where Churchill coined the term the Cold War in 1946, says America is less of a, a place than an idea. This was long before he contemplated any career in American politics, long before he had a stable of speechwriters. And he tried all of these ideas out on the riding the rails for General Electric as a corporate spokesperson. He begins to see America in a more of a metaphysical context or in its constitutional framework. He calls it more of a an idea than a place. I also like to think about how Churchill referred to great leadership when he said, a great leader is a person who can see the future and lead a people to it and through it, 
while at the same time handling contemporaneous issues. And the way I look at it is the sweet spot between the arrow, the vertical arrow, which perceives the future, and the horizontal line, which is handling issues and problems as they occur every day. And then I circle that sweet spot where the two meet. Handling the future, leading people to it and through it. And of course, Churchill demonstrated that, particularly when he gave his great speech, the finest hour speech, which he delivered only days after assuming uh, the, the role of prime minister, wartime prime minister, uh, in which he inspires 235 pages, by the way. He gives it to uh, Parliament and then goes over to the BBC and delivers this basically to the whole world. And he asks in a Reagan-like way, or I should say Reagan speaks in a Churchill-like way, he asks that question in the end. Will it be said of us? Will it be said of us in the future that this was our finest hour? Now, how did I come about learning these things about Ronald Reagan? I want to share four stories with you. The first is uh, taking us back to September 1st, 1983, when Reagan was called at his ranch up in the Santa Inez Mountains above Santa Barbara uh, and told that the Soviet Union had just shot down uh, Korean Air 007 with 283 people aboard, including 26 Americans, one U.S. congressman, and he was reluctant to uh, cut short his vacation and go back to that serious mahogany panel situation room, which he ultimately did. But he loved being at the ranch. And, uh, you know, ranch is sort of also a lavish term for something that is really what you would call a double wide. This is a house that Reagan, a masonry house, that was expanded from a small uh, shepherd's cottage that was there, tile floor, and believe me, I was there when the Queen, Queen Elizabeth came for lunch, uh, when Gorbachev came for lunch, and uh, when the Queen came, by the way, the uh, staff from the White House mess was in charge of serving, preparing and serving the lunch, and they had Tex-Mex for lunch for the Queen. And it's a little bit, I, I think, probably uh, challenging for Nancy Reagan to have the Queen, Queen of England come to lunch at this extremely modest house that is so modest that when Barbara Walters came up for an interview, we had to place the interview out on basically what might be the front lawn, but a, an extraordinarily beautiful one with a view of the ocean and the mountains in the back. And when she said to the president, well, what does this ranch really mean to you? He took with one sweep of his right arm and said, uh, from whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, uh, which signaled for those listening that this was a place with this vista that gave him that kind of inspiration uh, to, to really do his job. On the other hand, he was interviewed by Susan Water for the inaugural issue of M Magazine, and she conferred with her editor, John Fairchild, a very venerable editor, and they cooked up a question to ask Ronald Reagan for a story that they hoped would reveal some big sort of news for their uh, uh, new magazine, M Magazine. So she said to the president, Mr. President, what do you think about when you're chopping all that wood and clearing all that brush? And believe me, there's no wood or brush left up at the Reagan Ranch because that's what he did all the time. And so without skipping a beat, the, and she says, well, what do you think about when you're doing that, uh, chopping all that wood? And he said, the wood. So <laughs> that was as far as Ronald Reagan was willing to reveal what was going on inside his heart and soul. So he gets awakened in the night about the Korean air downing. And of course, he does get on Air Force when he goes back to the Situation Room. And he's being uh, implored by the staff of the NSC, State Department Pentagon, to come out and roundly denounce uh, this terrorist act. Uncharacteristic, perhaps, of Reagan, he decides it to tell them no. He's not going to uh, make a statement at that time. Now, Reagan was a person who was very skeptical of uh, government policymakers and advisors. He read all the briefing books. He did what he was supposed to do, but he kept his own counsel. Reagan was a person, and remember this, who would not be easily uh, convinced to change his mind 
really on I any issue because his mind was set basically on his principles that he was brought up with and he never deviated from them. He would compromise on legislative issues, for example, but he would never deviate from his principles. So in this case, he decides, no, I'm not going to say anything. He waits 48 hours. He comes to the Oval Office with a tape of the air traffic controllers to the pilots who actually downed the plane, telling them to down the plane. So he's telling, showing the world that even though the Soviets were saying, no, 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 we didn't do anything like this, this was absolute proof. But he goes on and he says in part to the, to the world, and make no mistake about it, this attack was not just against ourselves, this was the Soviet Union against the world and the moral precepts which guide human relations among people everywhere. It was an act of barbarism, born of a society which wantonly disregards individual rights and the value of human life and seeks constantly to expand and dominate other nations. Now, here is the interesting point. There are two interesting points about this. Number one, the reason Reagan waited was because he wanted to cast this terrorist event in the context of a world or a, a broader issue that the world is facing, which he confronted in his Orlando speech, of course, in 1983, when he calls the evil empire, just in line with six presidents before him, the evil empire. Uh, so he wants to uh, show the world, though he doesn't show them why, that it is important to denounce this not just as a specific act of terrorism committed by the Soviets, but that it's committed against the world. He's broadening the support, pulling in other people to his vision and his underlying strategy, which again, he never revealed. He never stood up and he said, this is my grand strategy. You never heard this, except that uh, tactically speaking, of course, the, uh, the U.S. maintained this uh, three-part strategy for uh, ending the Cold War, which was uh, economic sanctions, aggressive uh, diplomatic initiative, and military buildup. But that was, the sur on the surface, that was the government's strategy, which of course Reagan supported. There was something else going on, which I'll get to in a minute. Then Reagan goes on. Let us have faith in Abraham Lincoln's words that right makes might, and that, that in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. If we do, if we stand together and move forward with courage, then history will record that some good did come from this monstrous wrong that we will carry with us and remember for the rest of our lives. Now, here's the second part of Reagan as the great communicator and strategist. He's pulling everyone in to this incident. Then he's using a quotation from someone who has already been given the praise and the acknowledgement of a great leader. Reagan, 96% of his speeches, he quoted from the Patriots, he quoted from the Prophets, he quoted liberally from the Bible, he quoted from people who had already been accepted as great, as leaders of character. Reagan, you would rarely ever hear Reagan say, I. You would never say, hear Reagan say, this is what I think. I, I don't think you would ever find that in any speech. This is what I think. Reagan would use the, the grand words and the accepted words of people who had gone on before him. And you know, he also used humor in that because if he were quoting Thomas Jefferson, for example, he might uh, use some magnificent quote and say, and I know Jefferson said that because I knew Jefferson. So, you know, Reagan always used uh, humor in that way. The second story, of course, has to do with the great, uh, the six most iconic words of the last century, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So um, it had been decided that uh, we would go to Berlin to celebrate the 750th birthday of that ancient city because of the unrest in Eastern Europe, because of uh, NATO placed anti-ballistic missiles at the time and uh, get also provide an opportunity, again, to support the re reunification efforts of Germany. So a speech was written based on a young speech writer, Peter Robinson, who went to have what we would call today focus group meetings in Germany and asked the German people, the American president is coming here, what should he say? And they said over and over again, well, we think he should call on Gorbachev to tear the wall down. Hmm, interesting. So he brings it back to the speech writing staff 
and they like it. They take it into the president. And by the way, the, the way the president worked with the speechwriting staff, and they were the people who really knew Reagan best, he would be the, the grand architect. They would come back, they would backfill, they would create the remarks or the, or, or the speech, come back, and he would heavily edit, that, edit it. But he was a speechwriter's dream because they knew what his ideals were. They knew the great leaders that he admired. So they were able to, and that he was a big believer in the importance of heroism, and especially its importance to, the, to American style democracy, it, to herald heroes. So you see heroism throughout things that Reagan was saying. So in this case, they created a speech in which they called on Gorbachev to tear down this wall. So that speech, as it made the rounds to uh, the NSC, State Department, and the Pentagon, those remarks were whited out. I, I've spoken uh, three times in Texas, uh, once in, twice in Dallas, where the woman who invented whiteout was from. Now, how many of you remember whiteout? You know, we don't even use that phrase anymore, do we? So uh, those words were whiteout. So every time it came back to the Oval Office, the president put it back in until the last time. And even his own uh, Howard Baker his, was his uh, chief of staff at the time, said, no, 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 Mr. President, you're not saying that. You are not saying that. It's too inflammatory. Uh, it will hurt our fledgling bilateral relations and so forth. So he left it out. So he arrives at the Brandenburg Gate, and he's in a van that day, an armored van, not a limousine. And he gets out, and he tells his personal aide, uh, uh, Jim Kuhn, who's a, a friend of mine, he says to him, the boys at the State Department aren't going to like this. <laughs> so, of course, he gets up there and he calls on Gorbachev to tear this wall down. Now, that was not all he said. Now, those were the dominating words, right? But if you read the rest of it, Reagan is saying that he's opposed to any walls. Well, we talk a lot about walls today, don't we? Okay? But he's opposed to any walls that would separate a man from freedom. He's opposed to any walls that would separate a man from his God. And Reagan tied freedom and the ability to worship God as a unit. He knew that without freedom, people could not access or could not worship God and vice versa. He knew how important that compact was. And he was a, he was a freedom fighter. For, for that, for any fledgling democracies he could find anywhere in the world. So anyway, he talks about walls. And as a matter of fact, in his final speech uh, to the American people from the Oval Office, uh, he says, you know, in, I've never really described in great detail that shining city on a hill that I often talk about. And he said, but this is what I see when I see it. And he goes on to explain the city that he sees when he has this image in his thought of that shining city on a hill. And he says, and if there have to be walls, there are doors for anyone who would enter, who would want to enjoy, respect, and uphold the American way of life and freedom for all of its people. So Reagan goes to the Brandenburg Gate. He makes this speech. He makes this declaration. And it's a reflection of the character of Reagan. Now, how did I um, begin to understand this about Reagan. In 1981, I was asked at the beginning of the administration to create, uh, head up and manage a program called Private Sector Initiative, which was a part of the Reagan political plank, which stated that it was important to develop in the private sector answers for an investment in public problems, such as public health, public housing, public education, anything that the government had formally funded and managed before, it was the Reagan platform belief that the private sector should be engaged in addressing these more effectively, more efficiently, and as a cost savings uh, for uh, the taxpayer. So uh, this uh, was the program that I was asked to, to run, and the program reported directly to the president, into the president's office. Now, as it relates to a cabinet of, uh, officials, cabinet jobs, and uh, also other programs in the, in the West Wing. This was a tiny program, but it was reflective of Ronald Reagan's character, and it was his favorite program. So the day that we were to inaugurate this, we were to give a speech, the president was to give a speech 
uh, in Washington. So as we walked out of the Oval Office uh, together, I always say that I was kind of running to catch up with him because he was four inches taller than I, and he always walked as if he were wearing cowboy boots, which he didn't, but he always wore very, sh wore very shiny shoes, which he had people shining his shoes for him. Uh, but I always imagined that he always had shiny shoes. So I was running along with him. And then since it was the first time that I was riding solo in his car, I had ridden in motorcade rides before, but in staff vehicles, I didn't know which side of the car to get in on. So I had a crisis and I thought, what, I could just picture myself getting in the wrong side of the car, climbing over the president and falling in his lap. And I thought, that would not make a good uh, image. So I drew back just a little bit and I let him get in the car. And I saw, of course, it was on the right-hand side behind the agent that is not occupied by driving the car. So I walked around and got in the car and I said to him, well, let me tell you about the speech you're going to be giving today. No, 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 I don't want to talk about that. Okay, what are we going to talk about? So the motorcade, thankfully, was delayed by 20 minutes because of a traffic issue up on Connecticut Avenue. So, you know, there are 14 cars in a motorcade. This was on the South Lawn. You know, the last car is called the Death Watch, which is not a, a nice term to think about. But in any case, and then there's a decoy car, of course. So we sat in his car, and he opened up for me the roots of his character. And this is how he started about his mother. It's often said that Nancy Reagan was the most important person in, in Ronald Reagan's life. No, it was Nellie Reagan. He told me how his mother made him memorize the Bible to act in morality plays based on the Bible to go with her as she was an itinerant substitute minister, preacher in the Disciples of Christ Church to go on healing missions with her, to visit um, people of importunity and ill health in hospitals, and to minister to families that were even poorer than they were. They never owned their own home. They lived in rented apartments and houses uh, above stores. Uh, his father was an alcoholic, and his mother also gave him a book by, written by a former Disciples of Christ minister called That Printer of Udells, which Reagan patterned his life after. So he explains to me, the protagonist, and Reagan read this book 14 times and brought it to the White House. He showed it to me on his shelf. He patterns his life after a protagonist who also was the son of an alcoholic, who turns to public service, becomes an elected official in his community, and then goes on to Washington to be a congressman. Reagan patterns his life based on this book and patterns his character based on the religious teachings of his mother. He goes on to attend a church uh, college. His mentor in life was his minister. His girlfriend was the minister's daughter. Reagan, though no one knew this because he never talked about it, though Jimmy Carter did, he taught Sunday school until he was 23, traveling back from Eureka College 100 miles every Sunday to teach Sunday school and to run the youth program in, the, in Sunday afternoon. These were things, as he explained them to me, I thought, well, now this is a very different person than the person being portrayed. And as I went on the years with the Reagans, I thought to myself, what a shame that more people don't know this. And yet, I learned that it was brilliant on his part for two reasons. I felt that because people were sending me letters, they were sending me books about character, they were sending me Bibles, they were all religious tracts, and they would say, if you could just get Ronald Reagan to read these things, he would be a better president. Well, they didn't know that Ronald Reagan, in fact, was a Bible scholar. They didn't know that Ronald Reagan had these values because having been the child of an alcoholic, he considered it too costly to really expose too much of his personal vulnerability, what he would consider his interior to other people. But also, the second point was, had he done that, he never would have made a movie in Hollywood, and he never would have ascended to the most important job in the world, President of the United States, because he would have been marginalized had he shared these things. So through the years, I began to see what he explained to me that day, demonstrated in his acts, in his in his strategy and what he was able to accomplish, how he did it and why he did it. And this is really summarized in this last uh, vignette that I wanted to share with you. And that was 
at the Geneva summit in 1985, the first meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev. The, uh, there are a lot of stories to tell from that, but related to Reagan's character and the insight that I was able to draw about what was going on inside Ronald Reagan's head about these things and his heart. We're sitting in front of a massive roaring fire in the villa of the Aga Khan, which had been loaned to us, loaned to the Reagans to stay in. Um, and uh, I remember one night, as an aside, um, the Reagans, sometime when they would travel overseas, they'd like to get a, like have a massage so, so they could go to sleep the next night. Wouldn't we all like to have that? So um, they said, well, you know, do you think you could find someone? I thought, oh my gosh, so this is Geneva. It's like midnight. Where am I going to find someone? So I thought, well, I'll go down to the Intercontinental Hotel in Geneva. Those of the, that used to be the finest hotel in Geneva. So <clears throat> I went in and I went to the concierge and I said, is there any chance that you happen to have uh, a masseur, a masseuse, and so forth? And they said, oh, yes, we have them on staff. And so, so I took them in this White House car. They didn't know what it was. And so halfway over to this villa, I said, well, I thought to myself, well, I better share with them who they're going to be working on. <laughs> so they didn't know where I was. I was just taking them to uh, a client's house. So I'll never forget uh, how kind these people were to the Reagans. And Nancy Reagan saying to me the next morning, that was the nicest person that you found. She told me after uh, she you know, worked on me, she said to me, I love you and God bless you. And Nancy Reagan was so moved by that. Um, but anyway, that's just a little color incident. Those things go on uh, in the, when you're doing these jobs, as we were talking about over dinner, there's a radical kind of whipping back and forth between working on very serious policy issues and then going out and finding a, a, you know, a massage therapist for the President of the United States. So I was in a very unique role because of that. So anyway, the President and I were sitting in front of this roaring fire and the, Gorbachev, uh, were, the Gorbachevs were about to arrive for dinner and I said, to the president, what do you think will really bring down uh, totalitarianism, what, Soviet style communism? Wh what do you think it will really bring it down forever? And he said without skipping a beat, Jim, there's only one way. And remember, our professed strategy was the, the three part strategy, which you all know and which I just shared, reminded you of. And he said, it'll only come down one way, and that is through the people's own desire for freedom the people's own desire to know God. So, of course, the rest is history because we know that the beginning of the end and where Reagan, of course, provided cover for Gorbachev to liberalize his um, attitude toward the breakup of the Soviet Union. But we saw that, especially in Eastern Europe, the beginning of the end was in the churches and people's drive, their own drive for leadership. The Berlin Wall was not plowed down. The Berlin Wall was picked down, rock by rock, as you know. So lastly, I just want to close, and I'm happy to stand and answer questions for you, but um, Reagan revealed himself, I believe, and this book is all about revealing who Reagan was because it does matter. It's not because um, in a partisan way. Uh, it's because we need to understand what character leadership is, because each of us in this room has an obligation to those that follow us and look back on us 100 years from now to say, did they do everything they could to promote character-based leadership, to demand it, and to prepare young people to lead the world out of the morass that we find ourselves in today based on true character? So Reagan goes to give this great speech, one of his greatest, called The Boys of Ponte Hoc, at the 40th celebration of the, the 40th anniversary of D-Day. And if any of you, I'm sure many of you, how many of you been to, to Normandy and to the crosses? And you know, how can you go there and not? It's a very, very emotional experience, as you know. And I took Nancy Reagan there alone on the 38th anniversary. We found the one uh, grave of the one woman who was buried there. And Nancy Reagan laid uh, uh, a bouquet of flowers at 
at her grave site and said a prayer. But so we went back for the 40th and uh, it was decided that we would take a small group of men who were survivors of that uh, scaling those cliffs that day. So Reagan says, uh, that's why it was called the uh, boys of Ponto Hawk because these were the boys. So he says, 40 summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet, you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? Here's Reagan asking the question again. Why did you do it? What impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? We look at you and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief. It was loyalty and it was love. Something else helped the men of D-Day their rock-hard belief that providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here, that God was an ally in this great cause. And so the night before the invasion, when Colonel Wolverton asked his parachute troops to kneel with him in prayer, when he told them, do not bow your heads, but look up so you can see God and ask his blessing in what we're about to do. Also that night, General Matthew Ridgway, on his cot, listening in the darkness for the promise God made to Joshua, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. These are the things that impelled them. These are the things that shaped the unity of the Allies. It was stories like this, the bravery, the courage, the faith, the conviction, the willingness to give up of self and to fight for others, that Reagan celebrated, that he was inspired by. You know, Reagan was the first president, we, we see this now with all of our presidents, to bring heroes into the State of the Union galleries. Well, Reagan, I recently gave a speech about inspiration, uh, citing how Reagan got his own inspiration. Reagan was inspired by heroes. He was inspired by those people and their stories that were up in the gallery. And it added, it added texture and it added a spark to his own presentation because as he was going through that, delivering those big long speeches, he wanted to hang his remarks on the ideals that he felt. Now Reagan often loved to close his remarks by calling on people to take the action that I call on all of us here tonight to take as well. And he loved to quote from Thomas Paine, the great American patriot, uh, and also from Alfred Lord Tennyson, from his great poem, Ulysses, where he says, come, my friends, let us seek a newer world. And from Thomas Paine, that patriot, we have it within us to begin the world over again. Ronald Reagan said it so many times and with such conviction because he felt it in his heart, just as if he closed when he closed every address from, and Ronald Reagan was the person after Nixon who gave the most perorations from the Oval Office. Ronald Reagan felt if he could only get in front of and communicate directly to the American people, he could make them believe in his platform, in his program, in his ideals. He didn't want his communication uh, sifted through the sieve of the media. That's why the Saturday morning radio program was begun, so that he could communicate directly with the American people. But when he said, God bless America, you had the feeling that Reagan wanted God to bless America because he prayed for that. He spoke of this in his, he, he talked to me about it, he spoke of this in his diaries, and in that last talk, which I mentioned to you, in which he explained what he saw when he referred to that shining city on a hill. Peggy Noonan was involved in the writing of some of that speech, and she went into the Oval Office that night, and she said to Mari Mossing, who was the producer of, the, of that television show, the televised speech, she looked over at the president, and he was slumped down in his chair behind that grand resolute desk, the gift of Queen Victoria to the American people. She said, oh my gosh, is he okay? Is he okay? And 
Maury said to Peggy, that's what he always does. He's praying. Ronald Reagan was the prayerful leader. He was the leader of character. And because he built his belief system on the ideal of what he saw America could be, he was an example of the character that we need to find, perpetuate, support, and herald again today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take questions from back there. I think a uh, gentleman is going to the mic. I would appreciate if you'd expand on a statement, one of the many fascinating statements in this book. This is from the chapter of the Global Evangelist. Um, what I learned firsthand was that his impersonality or complete lack of personal ego or sensitivity was one of his greatest and yet most subtle strengths as a leader in public life. And you go on to expand that. But you also say in the next sentence, it was also one of his genuine weaknesses in his private and family life. I uh, wish you would expand on that thought. That is a very good question. And it's, um, it shows that... Thank you for reading and picking out that passage because it's one of the most important things to learn about Ronald Reagan. And it, as I said in the book, it's subtle. So here, Ronald Reagan was often called a friendless person, uh, a person who didn't have uh, a lot of uh, cohorts or uh, that he was, he was a loner. And uh, that was an, another thing that was very difficult to understand about Ronald Reagan. Some of this had to do, of course, with his upbringing, as I mentioned, being the child of an alcoholic. So, but the brilliance of it. So you see, like the point I made uh, earlier about had Ronald Reagan revealed the content of his heart, he never would have made it to the highest office in the land. Just like this, okay, think of this for a second. Ronald Reagan had no use for personal accolade or personal complaint. So he was never looking for, and this is why he was called the Teflon president, he was never looking for your approval, nor was he particularly affected by your criticism. So the result of that, and this is why I learned that this is a feature of great leadership, because you're not affected by that and you're not seeking it, you're less vulnerable to people who are lobbying you or giving you money to do certain things. Ronald Reagan didn't care. He didn't care, necess he didn't care about the poll results. We had polling, but it was mostly for us on the staff. Ronald Reagan heard those poll results, but he had this degree of impersonality, I believe, that really makes great leadership. I don't know if I've really explained it the way you, you want me to, but it's, it's a little difficult to put into words. But it's as if you had a friend who was very genuine, uh, courteous, kind, Interest, interesting, uh, and yet when you part, they're not thinking about you. They're not engaged in your life. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and it was unique about Ronald Reagan, and I have to say not being that kind of person, you know, I'm, I guess I'm the kind of person I want everyone to like me. Uh, mo most people, I suppose, are like that. Uh, but Ronald Reagan didn't care about that. And I would have thought that a great leader would be a person who would be more sensitive to that. But... That was an element of, of Reagan. But why do you say that was a weakness in his personal and family life? Because to be impersonal with your children doesn't work. <laughs> For those of you who have children, you know, you're, it's not, you can't be impersonal with your children. So, Is there an, uh, another question? Someone back here? Do you want to go to the mic there? Thank you. So, uh, you know, most of us are familiar that Ronald Reagan was the governor of California and then became the president. But how did, can you talk a little about prior to him becoming the governor, how he transitioned into, uh, you know, into the political career? What, what political offices did he hold, for instance? 
Well, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, people say they, in, in a way, in, probably to encapsulate his effectiveness in a way, they, Reagan was called the actor president. So people knew mostly that he came from acting in, in Hollywood, and they considered that, in fact, he was a good communicator because he was an actor. But in my estimation, that was not the job that actually contributed the most. So you see Reagan starts off uh, as a sportscaster, and you have to realize that uh, after he left college, you know, he was calling the games for the Chicago Cubs. And at that time, when you were calling the games for the Cubs, do you know that you were not actually at the ball field? You were in an isolated studio far away from the actual ball field, and it was being telegraphed to you what was happening on the ball field. So Ronald Reagan had to imagine what was going on and then create, and he was, he was one of the top five uh, sports broadcasters at the time. And these were people who were legendary. I mean, they were known at that time to the American people. Oh, you know, and they had great names and probably stage names and everything, but they were like heroic people. So they would create these fantastic plays and keep the radio audience just with their ear to the radio. But he wasn't even seeing them, okay? So this was, to me, uh, showing that Reagan could picture in his mind, in his heart, what he wanted to achieve. Later, all those years later, to say to Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, only worked because he imagined it coming down. You follow me? So when Reagan says, when he calls on someone to do something, it's not an idle, oh, by the way, you know, yes, I think Gorbachev should tear. No, he, he says it with the conviction that it can come down, it needs to come down, it will come down, and he's giving Gorbachev the cover to do it. So that was a mere, the beginning, really, of his career. The, you know, then he, he goes into film, but then he becomes seven times elected as the head of the Screen Actors Guild. So he's a Democrat, he's working on the, you know, he's the only president who, he was both worked for a labor union and a corporate, major corporation, General Electric, and then, you know, uh, converted his party. But he sees, and he begins carrying a handgun because he was threatened by communists, this is in the early 50s, have, having acid thrown in his face so that he couldn't perform as an actor anymore. So, if you can imagine that, so he starts carrying a handgun, and then I, he, he begins his migration to uh, the Republican side when he sees uh, uh, the McCarthy hearings, he sees uh, you know, communists there, he sees what labor is trying to do, and he begins to migrate. He doesn't make his migration complete until later when he introduces uh, Barry Goldwater and makes the great um, uh, speech where he says, it's not to the right or to the left. It's up or down, up to a great future for our children and grandchildren or down to the ash heap of history. It's the uh, Desti March of Destiny speech. So uh, that's where he makes his, finally makes his emergence. To me though, long-winded answer, but just to say that his most important job to me was as corporate spokesman for General Electric. Because there, and we have the evidence at the library of 1,200 speeches that he wrote in his own hand and he researched uh, on yellow legal pads. So this is showing that Ronald Reagan was not the mimic or the, the puppet of some speechwriters. He, he knew how to form a speech and uh, an effective one and deliver it time and time again at the factory gate. I believe this is where he really honed not only his public speaking on political issues, but his political platform trying it out. So that was, you know, then, you know, yes, he was governor, obviously governor of California and so forth, but that was the migration, so forth. Yes, sir. Um, I understand that uh, you had not met the president nor had worked on his campaign. So how did you get the job? <laughs> You know, usually people say it a little more pointedly, like, how did you get that job? You know? <laughs> this boy from Flint, Michigan. Okay, so uh, in uh, the late 70s in Washington, I was running a 
foundation of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And we hired, we did a lot of our work through consultants, and we happened to hire the firm in Los Angeles that ran the Reagan campaign. And I became, we became friendly with the people in that firm and remained friendly when I went to Cleveland to run the Standard Oil Foundation. And we were invited to attend the, that famous debate in Cleveland, you know, where Reagan says to Carter, there you go again, and that sort of thing. So we were there in the fourth row at that, and that was the first time. So when, after the president was elected, much to my surprise, I received a phone call uh, from these people who had run his campaign, inviting me to come work uh, in the administration. And at first, well, if you can believe this, I said no. Uh, uh, so I, I thought I was very happy in my job, and I had worked in Washington before, and I thought, well, this probably wouldn't amount to much. Well, I th slept on it for 24 hours, and I called them back, and I said, is that offer still good? Not knowing, of course, at that time, that I would ever be drawn into a relationship uh, like I had with uh, President of the United States and, and First Lady. Uh, so I had no, there was no thought in my mind that that was ever going to be the eventuality of it. But uh, that's how it happened. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you could share some insights on how Ronald Reagan's character kind of shown through in the Iran-Contra affair, please, when things weren't going real good. So a part of, uh, Ron, I explained to you about Ronald Reagan's impersonality, right? But another part of his character was that he was, and I think I mentioned this about Ford as well, conflict averse. And I, I think that he was a person who ne could not really grasp that anything, anyone, much less a person who worked for him, would ever do anything to harm him or to harm his political objectives and so forth. So I think the fact that um, what Oliver North was doing to, uh, to pursue what he thought was right, even though uh, it was opposed to what the Congress had, um, had passed that to, to, to stipulate that this could not be done, um, I think that the president simply was not, couldn't imagine that someone would do that. And then it was, when it was brought to his attention that this operation was underway, um, I think he wrestled with having to accept the fact that this happened on his watch, uh, even though, as I say, it was hard for him to grasp. But, you know, I sat with him so many times, uh, or, or several times, I should say, watching the evening news, and people, reporters would, in, journalists would invariably say damning things about the president. Uh, much like Bill O'Reilly has written this book full of lies, the killing of, of Reagan. Uh, and yet Reagan, you know, he, he might get a little bit angry, but uh, he just didn't see it. He just didn't see that he had enemies. So it was hard for him to deal with it. I think, there was, a, was there a question back there? Or down here? I think they want you to go back to the mic. Or, okay, do you want me to, can I repeat the question? Okay, I'll, have, I'll repeat it. and maybe I heard it wrong, but the implication was that we don't have, we have to look for character, good characters in people, that we don't have good characters. And I was wondering if you were thinking of uh, somebody like President Obama who doesn't have very good character, or Angela Merkel, or, you know, people like that. I mean, it seemed that you were sort of tossing anybody recent aside. No, I didn't toss anyone recent aside. I, I didn't mention any names at all. I, I am, uh, was simply, uh, the question was about, uh, did I, was I making reference to any leaders today when I was speaking of character? Um, I, what, I didn't make reference to any particular leaders. Of course, we, we do have uh, many, many people of character. Uh, I believe that we need to have uh, a conversation about and prepare young people better to understand what character comes from. And uh, that I, I think that I certainly feel that we need to have more leaders of greater character. It's not to say that I'm, I'm not denigrating any particular people today, uh, but I believe that we need to have that. Yes? Nowadays, it seems that we know more than we perhaps ever want to know about some of the people running for public office. Um, a lot of secrets or history, and I was wondering, 
When did you become aware that President Reagan had Alzheimer's disease? Do you find that that impacted his work? Um, did you or other staff have to help make accommodations, if, if any, for that? And do you think the public should have known more about that? I'm so glad that you asked me that question. So and in my visits with Nancy Reagan in the days leading up to her passing, uh, one time we s were sitting in her library in her house in Los Angeles, and we were sitting around an octagonal kind of walnut colored table, and she was in a wheelchair, and she was up to the end. She was very alert and um, uh, articulate and so forth, uh, but she, w she was failing s physically. So she was patting the table like this. And she said, you know, Jim, this is, you may remember, this is the table where Ronnie got his diagnosis. And I just let her talk. And, uh, and I'm glad that she did. And she said, you know, um, and, and I said, when exactly was that? And she said that was in March of 1994. And I recall, and we talked about, when the Reagans left the White House, in January of 1989, they went almost directly to Mayo Clinic. They went every year for a complete physical, mental workup. So they went 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, and then in 94, I guess it would have been at the end of 93, the, was the first time that Mayo detected any mental disability. That is when they came to the president and told him. Now, I asked her also at that time, how did the president take it? And she said, oh, Jim, just the way Ronnie took everything with optimism. And that really cut me to the quick because I thought with everything going on in the world uh, that I'm disturbed about, thinking about our future, our collective future. Can I say that I am an optimist? The way Ronald Reagan faced with this tremendous, uh, basically, uh, statement about prognosis of the end of his life, that he handled it with optimism. And I thought, since she told me that in those days, how it is that he could have been an optimist, even in a situation like that. And I've also thought, and I've certainly asked myself the question, I never saw any kind of mental disability or lack of mental acuity at all, nor did my colleagues. Uh, but this is all cleared up by the facts from the Mayo, doctors at Mayo Clinic. But in any case, I thought to myself, about why he could be optimistic. Ronald Reagan always said, America's best days are still ahead. And I believe he would still say that because he believed in the ultimate outcome of good and that man is always on a trajectory of progress. And even given, given the torturous political season that we're going through now, I believe that Ronald Reagan would have maintained this belief in, in America and the superiority of its ideals and its responsibility to the rest of the world to support uh, the uh, desire of all men to live free. So well, I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to sign books uh, outside for Christmas presents or any other kind of presents, but thank you all so much. I told you we'd have a great time tonight. What a wonderful respite from the current political situation, too, to take a step back. We have, as a token of our esteem and for your book signing, we have a pair of pens with oh, the signature beautiful. of our favorite president, Gerald Ford. So thank you. use in good health, and thank you so much thank for coming. So, this is great. You. Thank you. I'll let you go.